Hey everyone, welcome to the Frontline Community Church Podcast. My name is Jared, and I'm the group's resident here at Frontline in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Our mission is simple, to see zero people unchanged by Jesus. And so whether you've been following Jesus your whole life or your journey has just begun, we hope that this message will help you draw near to the person of Jesus, be challenged and encouraged by his word, and be moved to action. We hope these next few moments are a blessing to you and equip you to see who God really is and who you are in him. Everybody said, amen. All right. Thank you, Noah. Good morning, Frontline. <laughs> it's good to see you. It's good to be back with you again. It's been a while since I've been back here. If you're watching online, we're uh, thrilled to have you with us, uh, joining with us in the room as well. And I'm excited to be back here with my family. You, uh, if you're newer, you may not know this, but uh, my family attends Frontline and uh, I, was, I, I served as the lead pastor here for 16 years. And um, so it's just a joy whenever I get a chance to be back here and back home uh, with you again. And with that, I actually want to tell you something. Uh, one month from now, uh, I am, my son John and I, John is 16, and, and we're going to be part of this team of people from Frontline that is being sent to Ethiopia to our missions partner there, uh, we have a care point in a community called Ukro in Ethiopia that we've been uh, partnered with since 2015. And so uh, we're, we're going to be taking a trip there. And so we've got a table set out right out, right out here. Uh, you may have seen them when you walked in. They'll be there uh, even afterward, even before Behind the Line starts. We would love for all of you to go and visit the table because what we're all about with this trip is Bibles and chickens. That's what we're all about. Seriously. So uh, last, the last trip from Frontline um, that happened, the pastor of the Care Point, the community said, man, something I would just really love is if every single kid who's part of the Care Point, many of you sponsor those kids, uh, if they all had their own Bible uh, in their heart language that they could actually have in, in Amharic. And so a generous donor from Frontline has made that happen. And so we've actually got the Bibles that are there and to be a part of that, which is awesome. But we thought, what? yeah, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> With that, though, we said what would be cool is if uh, we just had a whole bunch of bookmarks from each of you that we could put in those Bibles. And so there is a bookmark decorating or, or create, creating opportunity out there. So write down either your favorite Bible verse or, I don't know, your name or a picture of yourself. I don't know what you want to do. Um, but we thought it'd be great to be able to give the kids Bibles with actual frontliners have made these bookmarks for the kids just as a way to continue to build um, the relationship. And then also with that, uh, we are, are actually, our next big project has to do with chickens to help the community become more self-sustaining. And so uh, some chickens have been purchased. We are not all the way there with our financial goal with that. So if you want to give um, at the table back there to help us reset goal, we, we'd love to have that reached um, as we head down there next month to do that. So that's Ukro. We're excited about that. Uh, with that said, I'm going to jump in this morning to our sermon uh, and all of our Zero Collective churches we, we've been looking at these encounters with God that people had in the Bible and, and that shaped them. And the fear of God always precedes anything great in our lives. And so I'll, I'll intro everything um, by saying this. Uh, my wife, Carrie, and I, we have four boys, and our two oldest boys are grown. They've moved out of the house. They're on their own now. And people ask, well, how are you dealing with that? How are you working through that? And so uh, our solution has been we just keep replacing them with dogs. That's what we do. That's how we get over it. So these are our dogs, our two hound dogs, uh, Ruby and Cassie. We love these dogs. They literally are like our, our replacement children. <laughs> That's what you do when you get to this stage of life. And so, uh, I, you know, the, the way I understand the relationship that I have with them is that I'm the master and they are the pets, right? That's the way I understand the relationship. I was thinking the other day, though, is that the way they see the relationship they have with me? I mean, if I think about life from their perspective, if you think about it, you know, they get the best seat on the couch, they get to pick wherever it is. They, they get the best seat on the couch. Whenever one of them runs toward a door, a human being jumps up from what they're doing and goes and opens the door for them to let them out. I mean, think about like, you know, the food and the walks from their viewpoint. I, I mean, how would you view a person who follows you around everywhere, picking up your poo with a little plastic bag on their hand? Would that be a person you would have awe and reverence for, you know? I mean, who really, who is the master and who's the pet from their viewpoint? I think my dogs think that they are the superior beings. I think that's what they think. And I say that because I wonder if it's the same with us and God. I wonder if it's the same in the way that we view God. So I want to ask you a question as we begin this morning. The question is, what do you picture when you think of God? All of us in this room, everybody watching online, when you picture God, you picture something. Something pops into your head. It's different for each of us. What do you picture 
when you think about God. For some of us, what we picture is like, you know, you picture like a cosmic friend, this, somebody who's just there for you. Whenever you're going through a tough time, he's there to comfort you. He's there to be there with you. Others of you, maybe if you grew up in a, in a strict kind of religious home, maybe you see God as like an angry old man with a lightning bolt, right? Ready to just like zap you as soon as you step out of line or do something wrong. Others of you, maybe you see God like a cosmic politician, right? Who, who agrees with you on every single issue, right? And yet you don't really know him. You don't, you don't know him personally. He's just kind of this distant figure. If I were to tell you the picture I had, I had of God for many years of my life, the way I viewed God whenever I pictured him was almost like a coach with a stopwatch. And every time I ran around the track, it was like, pick it up, not moving fast enough, a little, little slower, that one. Better. And so it was almost like I could never work hard enough, never do enough good things, that sort of thing. For years, that was like my picture of God that I had when I thought about him. I want to look uh, this morning at a quote to kind of get us into this. And this is a quote by A.W. Tozer. He wrote a book last century, great spiritual writer of last century, called The Knowledge of the Holy. And uh, it's a little bit longer quote, but stick with me. It packs a punch. Tozer said this, The most portentous fact about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. Were we able to extract from any man a complete answer to the question, what comes to your mind when you think about God, we might predict with certainty the spiritual future of that man. Okay, what Tozer is saying here, in case you, you, you didn't pick it up, is he's saying what you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. You are not just the byproduct of your circumstances or your culture, or the times that you're living in. You are a byproduct of your internal God picture. Because how you think about God will determine who you become. What comes to your mind when you think about God, how you picture him, will determine who you become. Now, if Tozer is right, and I think he is, if he's right, what that means is, Our problems that we face in life seem really, really big to us because our God seems really, really small. Now you say, come on, Brian, that seems a little simplistic. But I'm telling you, I I believe that the greatest need of any person, the greatest need of everybody in this room, the greatest need of any of us watching online, the greatest need of all, uh, all human beings is we need a vision of God that is powerful enough to transform us on the inside so that whatever we go through in life, we know we're okay. That's what we need more than we need anything else. A vision of God that is powerful enough, it can actually transform us and change us on the inside. And what we're going to look at this morning, that's exactly what God gives the prophet Isaiah. So if you've got your Bibles, you can turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. That's where we're going to be this morning. We're going to look at this encounter that Isaiah has with God. Now, it's six chapters into the book of Isaiah. He's one of the major prophets in the Old Testament. And Isaiah lived about 700 years before the birth of Jesus. And yet Isaiah, uh, his, the book of Isaiah contains some of the most incredible prophecies about Jesus, about the Messiah that Jesus came to fulfill. But really, this moment that we're going to look at uh, really, it's, it's six chapters in where Isaiah finally encounters God and he, and he gets a picture of who God is. And it's that picture of God that actually shapes everything else that comes in the book of Isaiah. It's that big a deal. It's that powerful. So I want to look at this together. This is Isaiah 6, starting in verse 1. It says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Seated on a throne, high and exalted, And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. So this is this powerful encounter where Isaiah 
sees the Lord. He gets a picture. He gets a vision of who God is. Now, I just want to take uh, the first couple lines of this and just break it uh, down a little bit to unpack this for us. So if you want to go ahead to that next slide there, the very first line it says is, in the year King Uzziah died. Can you go back? There we go. In the year King Uzziah died. So a little bit about this moment in history. The year, we know the year was 740 BC. And what we know is that King Uzziah reigned for 52 years as the king of Israel. Now, time out, stop for a moment. Uh, We're in an election year right now, right? Every four years, we have this time of great upheaval and, uh, you know, anxiety and fear about the future and where things are going to go and who's going to be the next leader. We experience that every four years on kind of a micro scale. But imagine, it's been 52 years. Uzziah has been the king of Israel and he's dead. And nobody knows what's coming next. Nobody knows what the plan is. And so this is a time of great fear. It's a a time of great anxiety, a time of great tension and conflict and turmoil for the nation. And what we know, 2 Chronicles chapter 26 tells us the story of King Uzziah's reign. He became king when he was 16 years old, reigned for 52 years, and he was known for two things, his prosperity and his pride. He was known as being one of the most prosperous, wealthy kings that Israel ever had in their history. He had one of the most powerful armies in Israel's history, but he also was known for being very prideful. Specifically, the story we're told in 2 Chronicles uh, is is that what King Uzziah did is he went into the temple and he tried to do the job of the priests. Only the priests were allowed to do the work of the Lord. And and Uzziah goes in, and specifically what he does is he tries to take the coal in the censer, and he tries to use it to burn incense. It seems like not that big a deal, but God had clearly ordained that it was only the the priests who were allowed to do this. And so the priests confront him, and they say, hey, King Uzziah, you're not allowed to do that. And he does it anyway because of his pride. And as a result, King Uzziah is struck with leprosy, and he has leprosy for all the rest of his life till the day he dies. And it says that in this time of great turmoil, great upheaval, this national, you know, upheaval, King Uzziah dies, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. I saw him. And it's important how he describes what he saw when he saw the Lord. So I want to kind of walk through the great significance. He said, I saw the Lord and he was seated on a throne. In other words, he's the real king. King Uzziah has just died, but I saw the Lord, and he was seated on the real throne. And he was high and exalted. He was high and lifted up above it all. And I love the fact that he was seated on the throne. It doesn't say he was like pacing back and forth in the throne room, like, oh man, what are we going to do? King Uzziah just died. What are we going to do? Did you know there's no cry of panic coming from heaven right now about what comes next? I saw the Lord, and he was seated on the throne, high and lifted up. He's in charge. He's he's not freaked out like we are. He's, He's completely in control. Then it says, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Why is that so important? Because in this time period, a king would be known by how long the train of his robe was. The longer the, ra- the, the train of a king's robe, the more important he was, the more things he'd done, the more years he'd been in office. So I imagine King Uzziah, when he walked around, he had a huge train. It was this long train of his robe. And, and Isaiah says, when I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and lifted up, the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, this is not like it was kind of long. It's like it was overlapping. Oh, no, all again, just it filled up the, the temple. And then the angelic beings, the seraphs, they're, they're saying this over and over and over again. It's this picture we get of the throne room of God in heaven. And, and what, you know, what, what the angels are saying is, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. He says it three times. In Jewish thinking, repeating something uh, signified its importance. You know, we kind of still do that today if you think about it. Like if somebody's dating, we go, are they dating or are they dating, dating? Right? Or, you know, they're, they're one, they mean different things. If my wife says, uh, hey, I'm going to go shopping, I say, are you shopping or are you shopping, shopping, right? One of those things means I'll be back in 45 minutes. The other one means goodbye, you're not going to see me for, for a while, right? And it says the angels are what they say. They're saying, holy, holy, holy. He's completely, the word holy means to be set apart. He's high and exalted on the throne 
And he is holy, holy, holy. He's above it all. Isaiah gets this vision. That's who God is in the midst of the turmoil and the chaos he's living in. Now, why is this vision so important? And I would tell you, it's not just important to Isaiah's life. It's not just important to the book of Isaiah. It's important to the entire Bible. Why is this moment and this revelation, this picture of who God is, why is this so important? It's because if you were Isaiah, what you would have wanted in this moment, it's the same thing that every single one of us wants right now. You would have wanted God to tell you what he was going to do. In fact, that's probably the reason why Isaiah went into the temple was to seek the Lord because he's like, what are you going to do? Is it, this, King Uzziah just died. What are you going to do, God? That's what we still want to know in times of uncertainty. In times when things aren't clear, we want God to show us or to tell us what he's going to do. We want to know, God, are you going to fix the marriage? God, are you going to fix our economy? God, are you going to heal the cancer? That's what we want to know. What are you going to do, God? And then I can figure out what I do. I love another great spiritual writer from last century, Oswald Chambers. I love what he said. He said, God does not tell you what he's going to do. He reveals to you who he is. And it turns out, that's actually what we need. That's actually what Isaiah needs. He needs a vision of God that is big enough and powerful enough to transform him on the inside so that whatever comes next, he's okay. It's the same for us. That's what God wants to give every single one of us. He doesn't want to just tell you what he's going to do. He wants to show you who he is. So let's look together at Isaiah's response. Isaiah has this vision of who God is. And this is Isaiah speaking. He says, woe to me, I cried. I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. I, I, I love this because when Isaiah has this vision of God, when he, when he sees God, what we see in those verses is that two things change. When Isaiah sees God, two things are changed. When he gets this picture of who God is, the first thing that changes is Isaiah's picture of himself changes. It's the same for us. When we see who God is, it changes how we see ourselves. You notice Isaiah's response when he has this vision of God? He literally like falls down on the ground. And he just says, woe is me. I am ruined. He says, literally in our language today, it's like saying, I, I'm canceled. That's what happened. I've been canceled. He realizes how broken he really is, how sinful he really is, how far the gap is. He's looking at God seated on a throne, high and lifted up, and he's realizing how far apart and how big the gap is between himself and his best efforts to be good and to do good things and how big God actually is. And I love this because at this moment, you know, Isaiah is literally like, woe to me, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. He's saying, I'm canceled. I'm canceled, God. And what Isaiah is about to find out is that God doesn't cancel sinners. He cancels sin. That's who he is. And that's what happens to us when we get a picture of who God is. We realize in so many ways that we're way worse than we thought we were, our sin and our brokenness. But we're also more loved than we ever dared imagine. We're precious. We're adored. We're sought after. You see it in the text. Do you, do you remember what Uzziah's great sin was? I just said it a moment ago. His great sin and his pride, Uzziah, what he did is he went and he tried to take the coal from the censer and burn incense for him. He, in other words, he tried to atone for his own sin. He tried to make himself right. He tried to fix himself. But Uzziah was not great enough. As great a king he was, he wasn't great enough to fix himself, to atone for his own sin. Isaiah is not great enough to fix himself. So it has to be God in the form of the angel. He takes the coal and he goes and he does it on Isaiah's behalf. He touches his mouth and he says, look, your guilt is atoned for. Your sin, your sin has been made clean. And that's exactly what each one of us needs as well. We can't do it ourselves. In many ways, the coal in this passage points toward the cross. It points toward Jesus, who came 
and he died on our behalf on the cross. And he offered himself in a sacrificial death on our behalf, paying the price for our sin, atoning for our guilt and our sin, because he's the only one who could. He's the only one who could. Uzziah couldn't fix himself. Isaiah couldn't fix himself. You and I can't. It's not enough. Like, if, if it was enough just to, like, believe the right things and do the right things, then there would have never been any need for Jesus to come and die on the cross. Right? God would have just said, hey, like the, like the coach with the stopwatch, like, hey, pick it up, run a little faster. You're falling behind. In this moment, God would have just said to Isaiah, yeah, now that you've seen me, you better, you better work harder. You better clean it up. That's not what he does. It's God who takes the coal, and it's God is the one who has to, to cleanse his lips. When you see the cross, when you see him dying for you, you realize how broken and how sinful and how big a price sin actually is in your life, and you also realize that you are loved beyond your wildest dreams. Whenever I talk to somebody and I ask the question, I say, are you a Christian? And whenever the person answers that question, I going, well, I'm trying. I'm trying to be a Christian. Like, I'm trying to go to church. I'm, I'm trying to be a Christian. I'm trying to do you know, better things with my life. Whenever somebody answers that way, it tells me that they have not yet seen the Lord. They haven't yet seen God. Because being a Christian isn't something you try to be. Either, either you are, either you've encountered him, and you've seen who he is, or you haven't. He's the one who has to do it. First thing that changes for Isaiah when he sees the Lord is his picture of himself changes. The second thing that changes when he gets this picture of God is Isaiah's picture of his own future changes. His picture of himself changes. He sees himself in a different light. And it's the same for us when we really see God, our picture of our future changes. Let's read that last verse in our text uh, together. This is Isaiah 6, verse 8. Isaiah's response, he says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Seeing the Lord always requires a response. At this moment, Isaiah's response, when he sees the Lord, he says, here am I, send me. He gives God his all. He says, you get to be the one that directs my future. You get to be the one that figures out where I'm sent. You get to be the one that directs my path. And everything else that follows in the book of Isaiah is a result of that response of saying, God, you can have my future. God wants to do that. He wants to transform where our hope is coming from when it comes to the way we look and we view our future. He wants to show us a picture of who he is that is powerful enough to transform us on the inside so that we're not afraid as we look forward to the future. I have a friend. uh, She's a young mom. She has two kids. And a couple years ago, her eight-year-old son uh, was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. And this particular form of cancer, uh, the survival rates are very low. So most kids who are diagnosed with this you know, don't survive it. So it was a horrible year where literally all these treatments began and they thought literally he, that he was probably, they were probably going to lose him. And um, she had to go through, my friend, uh, his mom had to go through like a bone marrow, uh, you know, uh, transfer and everything. I mean, so they both were sick for a long time and went through all this ordeal. And at the end of a year, what happened was he actually was one of, of the rare ones, one of the lucky ones, and the treatments did work and he did go into remission. And today, his life has been spared, and he is uh, restored to health. And he was one of the lucky ones that, that didn't uh, lose his life. But through this whole process, my friend, she met all these other parents, all these other families going through the same process with a child who is not going to make it. And she's a photographer by trade. That's what she does. So she takes pictures of people's weddings or the, you know, senior pictures or whatever. And so she was, she was talking, she was saying, so what I've been doing is I've been u- using my photography, and I've been connecting with all these families, you know, who have a child, and when they know their child is going to die, they know their their kid isn't going to make it, she'll offer to do like a photo shoot. So, you know, before they get really bad, like with tubes, you know, coming out of them and in a hospital bed, they'll go to a park together or some place that's, that's special to their family, and she'll take these family pictures with them, with their child, while they're still well enough to do that. So they have this picture to remember their child. Now, why is she doing that? She's doing it because she knows 
exactly what you and I know, exactly what every one of us in this room knows. It's that death cheats people. That's what it does. And all of us have been cheated. Death cheats us out of time, out of plans for the future. It cheats us out of one more conversation. It cheats us out of tomorrow's. And so her, her best remedy to that is, to, is to, to care for these families is to gather them together and to give them a, a picture, some way to remember their child before death cheats them out of their child. When I heard it, I'll be honest, my response was kind of cynical. When I, when I heard that this is what she was doing, I, I just, my thoughts were like, man, I don't know how helpful that would really be. As a pastor, I've walked with several families as they're going through the process of losing a child. And let me tell you, Death is always hard. It's always a loss. It's always difficult. But when, when somebody loses a child, to me, that is the worst kind of pain I've ever witnessed anybody go through. It's just absolutely gut-wrenching. It's awful. And so literally, my response, cynically, I was just kind of like, I don't think that's a help. I don't know how that would be a help to these people to have this picture then to remember their child was sick and to remember what they lost. And I was thinking about it later, and I felt like God really convicted me, and God confronted me that I was looking at that through kind of worldly eyes, not really looking through it through the vision of who God is. And I remember as as I began to think about that, and the Lord began to to convict me with that, I began to realize, no, wait, of course, that is the perfect thing to do. Because because there's a difference how people who know Jesus and who have encountered God and have seen the Lord and have allowed him to change them see as something like that than people would see it if they don't. For people who don't know Jesus, a picture like that with their child would only ever be a reminder of the past, of what they've lost, of what will never be again. But for those families who are Christians, who know Jesus, who have experienced him and and who have, have encountered him, that picture is a picture of the future, of what will be perfected one day, one day when he will wipe the tears from every eye and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things will pass away and behold, he is going to make all things new. You see it. Something like that can transform the way we look at our lives and the way we look at our futures. I love the way Jesus said it. He said it, we we gloss over this verse. We don't understand how powerful it is. Jesus literally said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Do you understand what Jesus is saying there? What he's actually offering up in that passage? Jesus is not saying, hey, I have come to kind of offer a consolation prize. I've come to bring a little bit of comfort to help you feel better about all that you're being cheated out of with death. I'm hoping it'll help you. I'm hoping it'll make you feel better. No, Jesus is saying, I have come to cheat death itself and rob it of its power and give you back your lives. Do you want that? Do you want that? Because that is the only thing that can change a picture from just a reminder of the past and what you've lost to a hope for your future. That's what he wants to give you. That's what he wants to give us. I love what John Newton said, the famous uh, uh, guy who wrote uh, Amazing Grace, the hymn we sing. He said, uh, if you understand your future glory, it will make the best times leavable and the worst times bearable. I love that. When you understand your future glory, what you have in Christ, it makes the best times of this world leavable and your worst times bearable bearable. That's what he came to offer. But here's the, the problem. Here's the bad news. Just because Jesus came that you may have life, and just because he offered his life on the cross for us so that we could have life and have it to the full, does not mean that you have that life yet. Like we just said a minute ago, seeing God res- requires a response. He wants to change the way you see yourself. He wants to change the way you see your future. He wants to transform you on the inside. But you have to respond. You have to actually say yes to the invitation. Jesus came and took on flesh so that we could see the Lord, so that we could see God, see what he looked like, see what he did, see how he interacted, and so that we could know God personally, so that we could have the same experience that Isaiah had. And so Jesus came that we could ha- see God and have life. And so uh, the only question I want to answer as we kind of wrap things up here is, how do you get that life? 
And I don't want to leave this room today or have you turn off the live stream yet until we've talked about exactly how you can receive that life. Because some of you are just going through life and, and you need this. The way you get that life that Jesus came to offer is you have to confess, repent, and receive Jesus. Confess, repent, and receive Jesus. I heard it described uh, this way one time. It's uh, those three things. It's almost like being lost in the woods. So imagine you're walking in the woods and you're lost. And so confession is admitting that you're lost, right? Confession is saying, wow, I am lost. I don't know where I am. That's confession. Repentance is literally stop walking, stop going the wrong direction, and turn around and say, I'm not going to keep walking in the wrong direction. And then receiving Jesus is receiving the right way, the, the only way to, to, to get out of the situation, to, to, to be saved. And so that's what I want to give you an opportunity to do today. Uh, and I, I've really prayed in this service, um, prayed for, for today, for this Sunday, that this will be the day where you could say, man, I saw the Lord and I responded to the invitation. So I want, will you bow your heads with me? If you're here in the room, if you're watching online, you can do this with us as well. But I want you to bow your heads and then, um, well, let's do this. Just so I know who I'm talking to here in the room. With your, with your heads bowed, I wonder if you'd be willing to raise your hand. Just answer, raise your hand if you know for sure that you've encountered Jesus and that you have eternal life. Raise your hand if you know for sure you've encountered Jesus. Have, yeah, okay, that's most of us. Most of us in the room. Yeah. Okay, you can put your hands down. Okay, now raise your hands if you know for sure. And I know this will take some boldness. It'll take some guts. Raise your hand if you know for sure you have not encountered Jesus and you know for sure you don't have eternal life. Raise your hand. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. That takes guts. Okay, last question. Raise your hand if you would just say, I'm not sure. Raise your hand if you say, I'm not sure if, I, if I've really encountered. Okay, thank you. That takes boldness to do that. Thank you. All over the room. Keep your hands up for a second. You say, I just don't know if I know for sure that I actually have encountered. I'm not sure if I know if I've got eternal life. Okay. Put your hands down. I mean, there's a fourth group of us, right? That's the, there are some of you who didn't raise your hand at all. If we're honest, you and I both know what that means. It means you don't know for sure. So if you're at a point this morning where you would say, I'm sick of trying to fix myself. I'm sick of trying to be a Christian. If you're ready to say, I, I want to see the Lord. I want to know that I have eternal life, that my future has been fixed, that he's paid the price for my sin. I want you to, to pray this prayer with me. And it could just be in your own words. Or you can use borrow mind. All, all prayer is, is just talking to God. So in the quietness of your own heart, let's just go to him. Jesus, right now, I just come to you. I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I acknowledge that there's no matter, no, you know, amount of effort that I could put forth that I could do to fix myself. I acknowledge that you are holy. And I repent of my sin today. I turn to you. I turn away from all self-effort. I turn away from all, all the brokenness in my life. I turn to you as the only solution. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to come in and be Lord of my life be Savior of my life. I confess you now as Lord. I ask you to come and change me on the inside. And give me the hope of eternal life all the rest of my days. I say to you today, Jesus, here am I. Send me. You can have me. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Okay, look at me. Look, look at me. Everybody in the room, look at me. If you're watching online, look at me. If you just made that decision, if you just prayed that prayer and you meant it, what we believe is that you just got saved. Your life has been redeemed. You are a child of God. You've been ransomed and reconciled by the Most High. And nothing can take that away from you. Nothing can stop that. What we need more than we need to know what God's going to do next is we need a big picture of who he is. Because that's the best thing we could have. So here's how I want to close today. Your, the relationship you just started with Jesus is very personal. Our relationship with Jesus is personal. Your relationship with him as you walk with him and live with him is going to look different than other people. It's unique to each one of us, but it's not private. That's what I want you to hear. Our relationship with Jesus is personal, but it is not private. 
Uh, Matthew 10, 32, Jesus says, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. And so I want to invite you to do something to make it public, to put a stake in the ground. So this isn't just something I did on a Sunday morning and go back to life as usual. Let's do something to make it public, to, to make it real. And so uh, as I was praying and preparing for this sermon, I felt like what God said is I felt like I was supposed to just give a gift to anybody who, um, it's nothing fancy, uh, but go ahead if you want to. There, there's this picture. We, we had these little keychains made with a, a, a picture, you know, they're like p- picture keychains. It just says, I saw the Lord September 22nd, 2024. And it just says that the scripture uh, reference on the back of it. And here's what I want to do. Uh, I just feel like prompted that I want to give a gift to you because, you know, we've been talking about a picture of God, right? We need a picture of God that changes the picture of how we see ourselves and the picture of how we see our future. And so, you know, a lot of times we'll put like pictures on keychains. I've done that. And so the idea would be to take this keychain with you, put your keys on it, put it somewhere where you're going to see it, where you're going to remember it. It's going to remind you, that's right. I'm a child of the King. I've been redeemed. My life is not the same as it was. My future is in him. And just put it somewhere where it reminds you, this is who I am in Christ. So here's what I'd love for you to do. On, on all the seats all around, there are uh, these little cards. So even as I'm talking right now, if you, if you made that decision, if you prayed to, to receive Christ, uh, will you take that card? And even as I'm talking right now, just begin to, to fill it out. That here's what we want you to do. You can follow me with the camera here. Uh, we've got these, and people did this for a service too. We've got two uh, baskets on this side of the stage and on that side of the stage. And uh, in a moment when we stand and we sing, we'd love for you to come forward and then just put your card in that basket going public and just saying, yes, I made this decision. And then take in the other basket, take one of these keychains and take it home with you. Keep it, put it somewhere where you'll see it and let it be a reminder. This is not a finish line. This is a starting point. It's a beginning of what God wants to do for a life that's going to go on for all of eternity. So that's the gift we want to give you. So I'm going to do this. Why don't you stand up in the room and you can fill out those cards even as I'm talking right now. And as soon as we start singing, you come, put that, uh, put that card in the box and then take, um, take one of these as a gift to you. And oh, by the way, if the rest of you, if maybe some of you, those of you who raised your hands for the first question and you know for sure that you've encountered Jesus, you know for sure that you have eternal life. If you're wondering, well, what am I supposed to do right now? Let me tell you your job when people come forward and they take these gifts, your job is to lose your freaking mind and celebrate and cheer and clap because that's what all of heaven is doing is celebrating people who've come to know Jesus. It's what he came for. It's what he died for. And it's what what we are about as the church. So let's sing, let's celebrate, and you come. We hope this message encouraged you in seeing who God is and who you are in Him. If you want to take a next step, visit frontlinegr.com slash next. We look forward to connecting with you there, and we'll see you back here next week.